What I love about addressing blood pressure is that, first of all, in terms of us being blind to what is going on inside our bodies and then somehow at 50 or 60 running into problems, blood pressure is something that we could get on top of pretty early if we started paying attention. So how do you view blood pressure? How do you frame it with your patients? Um, yeah, and then we can maybe dig into treatment potentially depending on where we go with this. And I, I would argue this is just as important as the ApoB discussion, mm -hmm. but for a slightly different reason. And the reason is here you have a physiologic parameter that not only shortens your length when it comes to cardiovascular disease, but also does so with respect to Alzheimer's disease and dementia. By the way, we didn't talk about that with ApoB, but ApoB is also probably lowering ApoB is, I would say, one of the three most potent interventions you have to avoid dementia and Alzheimer's disease. We should, we should maybe bracket that and come back to that. That doesn't get nearly enough attention, yeah. right? There are, you know, along with exercise, reducing lipids is unambiguously the surest way to prevent Alzheimer's disease and dementia, but so too is lowering blood pressure. And the other thing that doesn't get nearly as much attention is the impact of elevated blood pressure on kidney function mm. and how significant this becomes in an aging population. And while, you know, this rarely gets a 40, 50, or even 60 year old into trouble, it starts to become very problematic when people are in their seventies and eighties. And when you have very compromised kidney function, one, it makes it much less likely that you're going to live to say 90. And also you become far more susceptible to toxins that, you know, your kidney would normally filter out when your kidney is functioning at a quarter of its capacity. So blood pressure, as you said, is partially complicated by the fact that we as a medical community don't do a great job measuring it in our patients. Yeah. So you very accurately alluded to the exact problem, right? Which is patient, you know, parks the car, has to run up the stairs, sit in the, you know, reception area, get quickly shuttled back, have their blood pressure checked with an automated cuff. And that number doesn't tell us much. I mean, we know from the sprint trial that there is a really clear protocol for how to measure mm. blood pressure. And you need to be sitting comfortably with your legs uncrossed, not speaking for five minutes. The automated cuff or the manual cuff needs to be placed in exactly the right way, such that the marking on the cuff aligns with the brachial artery yeah. and such that the cuff is at the level of the right atrium, i.e. where the vena cava, superior and inferior, empty into the heart. It, you know, it, I think it's interesting, and I do this all the time just to show people, Take a blood pressure reading with your arm significantly above or below your heart, and you will be amazed nice. at the difference in pressure. It is very sensitive to this finding. For this reason, we typically recommend that our patients get a very high quality monitor, and we typically direct them to two or three that we fancy and let them buy it on Amazon or at their local drugstore. We give them a log electronically. And we ask that they check their blood pressure twice a day in the morning, in, in the afternoon or evening, according to this protocol. And we don't even make assessments on this until we have at least two weeks of data. Hmm. But those data now we can believe, we can trust those data. And now we know if those numbers average above 120 over 80, we need to take action. Because again, this is where the largest, most well-conducted blood pressure studies make it abundantly clear that treating either with lifestyle or pharmacology to better than 120 over 80 has significant benefits and outcomes over even 130 over 85, where we used to historically consider the upper limit of normal. Yeah, it's such a good point. Measuring it correctly of course it's really important otherwise people can go out buy something from the local drugstore try and take ownership of their health and then start to stress themselves out that actually whoa my blood pressure is really really high there's a couple of couple of things there for me uh to, to discuss Peter. one of them is trackers in general mm. because certainly as someone who's observed you online for uh, a number of years You've been pretty open with what you track. You've shared lots of times about the sort of things that you do track. And of course, 
not everyone is pro trackers. And um, my view is, is that it often depends on the personality type in terms of, you know, I have had patients in the past, let's say 10 years ago, for example, um, I seem to recall that maybe, you know, and I say 50% of patients, this is just, you know, a rough guess, but basically around half of my patients, when they would say, should I get a blood pressure monitor? Would it be helpful? I said, hey, sure, why don't you pick one up? And, um, you know, let, let's let's sort of see what happens or, you know, measure it at these times. Uh, what I found is that maybe half of the patients would measure maybe three or four times a week and they would use it as a way of keeping them on track with lifestyle change. It would help motivate them. Whereas the other half I found would start checking it six times a day. If one of them was slightly elevated, it would make them anxious. It would probably drive up their blood pressure for the rest of the day. <laughs> They'd be phoning. And so I thought, okay, is this good or bad? Coming back to what you said previously, Peter, well, it kind of depends, right? It depends mm -hmm. on who you are. So I like what you're doing as a practice where you have this set protocol. You're not really looking at those individual numbers. It's like, just do, you know, do this for two weeks and then let us have a look and see what the overall pattern is. I think that's useful. So given that many people will get their blood pressure at the doctors in this suboptimal way, or they're going to pick one up from their local pharmacy, where do you see trackers here? I know I heard you say in a conversation a little while ago that you were checking out a few of these risk trackers. You know, I hope we get to CGMs because I think CGMs are one of the most powerful tools I have seen to change behavior in my two decades of practice. I, I, I don't think I've seen anything as powerful in real time do that. But just to finish off on blood pressure a little bit, where are you up to with that, with your sort of investigation into this kind of non-invasive um, monitoring at home? So... Uh, first of all, I just want to reiterate what you've said, and I, I agree completely. Um, I do think people tend to major in the minor and minor in the major a little bit. And the, the tracking is a tool. People tend to get distracted by the tool and they miss the substance. The substance is the, the insight from the tool and what you do with it. And for some people, tracking is a very valuable insight generating tool. And for some people, it's also a very valuable uh, behavioral tool, we'll, as we will talk about with CGM. Um, but when I see the debates between the tracking and the anti-tracking community, it strikes me as religious, political, partisan, and uninformed. Yeah. And so I, I actually try to distance myself from that a little bit. Um, I have a point of view on the benefit of these things. Um, but I'm, I, I find myself less interested in debating it because I don't find the debates to be full of merit. They tend to be, um, again, they just tend to, to, you know, degrade into sort of unhelpful, uh, debates. Especially online, right? That's never in my experience, you know, on Twitter or on Instagram, you, you, especially on Twitter, you're yeah. very unlikely to, you know, get to some sort of meaningful place at the end of it where everyone's learned a little bit, everyone's evolved their understanding. I, I know as a fellow podcaster, I feel these debates or these kind of things, long form podcasting, I feel is the best medium to have those conversations because the nuance and context comes out within them. Whereas online, it's just like, as you say, it deteriorates very, very quickly. So like you, I, I just stay out of them and distance and, and say what I have to say on this podcast, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I've had really interesting discussions with people, um, about people who, who might disagree with me on, on various things. Yeah. And, and yeah, these discussions, when you have them properly over the phone or whatever, they, they tend to be much more productive. Um, so as it pertains to blood pressure, um, I would have to guess that even the harshest critic of tracking as a general concept would at least have to maintain some interest in continuous blood pressure monitoring. Yeah. Because this is something where there are so many limitations of spot checking. So even if you get over the limitations we just described, which are numerous, you still have the limitation of even if you do it perfectly, you're only looking at two points in time. 
Yeah. You don't know what your blood pressure is at night. You don't know what your blood pressure is when you're working, when you're on a phone call and you're stressed out or when you're making dinner or all these other things. And what we really would like to know potentially is what is your average blood pressure over the course of a day? And today, the only way to really do that is with a 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitor, what's called an ABPM. And I've worn one of these before. So it's an actual cuff that you wear on your arm that's hooked up to a regular blood pressure machine, except that it's smaller and it's set to cycle every 15 minutes. And so you wear this thing for a couple of days, you take it off when you shower, but otherwise you're wearing it 24 seven and it's just cycling like a regular blood pressure cuff every 24 Mm -hmm. hours. But the problem is it's so cumbersome that it doesn't really lend itself to great use. And I, for someone like me who actually doesn't mind being tracked, I found it so cumbersome that I, I quickly got rid of it. So there are devices out there now, um, one of which I've played quite a bit with, um, that measure blood pressure optically off the back of the wrist, and they're calibrated to um, uh, an automated cuff measurement. It's too soon for me to say what I think of these devices, but, but I'm very curious and I'm very hopeful and optimistic that these things pan out. Because I, I really think that that's a piece of information I would like to know for all of my patients. I would really like to know what their average blood pressure is. And I, I think that would probably be even more important than knowing what their average blood glucose is. Yeah. I mean, I'm pretty sure we'll solve this problem, won't we, with technology the way it is, whether it's now or in six months or 12 months or two years. It's it's inconceivable to me that we won't at some point have an excellent non-invasive um, blood pressure tracker that really gives us that information, in, I guess in a, in, in a way that CGM does, right? In a way that yeah. that gives us information in a very, in a way that you can barely know you're wearing one. Just just going back to blood pressure, your target of 120 over 80, as you say, is is lower now. It's more aggressive than what we were certainly doing five or 10 years ago in medicine. Um, Is there a specific trial that made you realize, I think there's quite a few, but that, you know, where- where Yeah, I think think the most recent sprint trial is where we we saw that what was then described as aggressive management versus standard management. Was there a difference? And the answer was, yeah, there really was a difference. Uh, Would you go even lower? So again, lower you're saying with ApoB, you strongly uh, believe is better for your risk of uh, atherosclerosis. Um, Can we say the same thing for blood pressure? You know, what if it goes to 115 to 110, as long as of course you're not getting dizziness or... Well, that's that's the big if, right? I, I, I mean... You know, blood pressure is one of those things where symptoms matter a lot on yeah. the low end. They don't matter on the high end. In other words, we're not going to wait until people are symptomatic to say your blood pressure is too high, but we would certainly back off if, if the symptoms are low. And that's why, you know, I'm, ev- I'm, you know, I'm much slower to turn to pharmacologic interventions on blood pressure than I am on lipids because you don't pay as heavy a price mm-hmm. on the lipid side, right? You, you don't need ApoB. This is a big mis- misconception. You have plenty of essential cholesterol in your body floating around without ApoB. Kids have an ApoB concentration of 10 to 20 milligrams per deciliter. It's nothing. And yet kids have no problem with the profound and rapid period of growth that they go through, including in their central nervous system. Yeah. Right. So think about that. All these people who say, oh my God, you can't lower cholesterol because your brain will starve. I mean, there's categorically nonsense, right? The, the most aggressive, ravenous appetite that the CNS has for growth is during a period of life when you have the lowest level of cholesterol. So there is no downside to lowering cholesterol except for the side effects of the medicines that you use to do it. And that's, we've discussed those and they're important and you need to understand them. With blood pressure, it's quite different. It's not so much the side effect of the medicine, it's the side effect, which, which by the way, there are side effects to those medicines, but the far more dangerous side effects are the dangerous side effects of hypotension and orthostatic hypotension in particular. And so I would much rather use exercise and weight loss 
and sleep improvements as you know, and that includes correcting sleep apnea if it's present as the three first, second, third line agents to fix hypotension, because the body is much better at auto regulation yeah. under that setting than if you have to turn to something pharmacologic. And we would really only want to use pharmacologic agents when we have reached the limit of those other three. If you enjoyed that clip, here's another powerful clip that I think you are really going to enjoy. Blood pressure comes down, joints seem to get better, bowel symptoms seem to get better. This is going to keep your eyesight. This is going to keep you from getting dementia, renal disease, peripheral vascular disease, and cancers. You are not your habits. You can do it.